So right. last week, uh, something kept coming up a lot, and I'm sure that you guys understand why, because it's something that you want to talk about quite a bit, and that would be zero days. Um, specifically, you were talking about how preparation is kind of pointless because, well, that would be, you know, defeat the point of what a zero day is. So what are your thoughts there on how to be a little bit more safe around that idea? Like are we talking about from the... Uh... Yeah, from, so I, I just want to know, like, are we talking about from, like, an end-user perspective, like, a, um, or from a developer perspective, like, I'm, I think that's kind of two different perspectives. I'm a, I'm a company, I've got a lot of money, a lot of things, I don't want it to, you know, get in the wrong hands, and I'm the next target for a zero day. Obviously, I can't just prepare for it. What, what do I do? I mean, I, I think you can prepare for it to an extent. Um, I think you can prepare for a zero day by having proper detection and prevention mechanisms in your network. You know, um, you can't block the zero day. Obviously, you can still get exploited, but that's why we go with assume compromise. You assume compromise, you should be prepared to defend your, your network against a compromise, whether it's a zero day or, you know, a year old exploit that you forgot to patch. You should be able to detect that and prevent somebody doing something malicious on your, your network by having those controls in place. Yeah, I, I guess that's what I meant by protect. Like, uh, you can't prepare for it, as in, like, obviously there's steps to take, which is what I'm trying to get from you guys. You can't, you can't prepare for something that you don't know about, but there are ways to prepare for the general problem. I mean, clearly I agree with Nick, too, but I think that it's a bit of a different perspective. Um, I, I think that... So, I don't know. So, so I was reading over like a lot of the stuff Project Zero does, and um, so one of their, uh, you know, kind of mainstays is that uh, you're gonna find zero days regardless because things are complex, and when you have complex machines or weird machines, um, you know, regardless of what you put as far as mitigation, uh, you, you're gonna have some type of failure uh, for that specific because mitigations are just they're specific um even if they're broad they're specific because things are so complex and particularly software is really complex so all i was going to say is i think there's a level of there's a balance um in the beginning that software engineers can apply as far as testing 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 um design implementation so i think that that's that's a start uh but it's kind of a whole different you know if you switch over to what nick was saying you know it's kind of a whole different um requirement for the end user because sure yeah testing is probably part of that too uh you know testing your your network architecture assuming compromise to what you do have um but you know there's i don't know i'll let somebody else talk <laughs> that was that was my concept of of different size well i think Okay, well, I mean, we could drop that then if, if that's kind of where you were going with it, I guess. I don't know. But I guess maybe in response to what Nick was saying, too, you know, the zero day, dropping the zero day or like exploiting with the zero day, that is not a goal for an attacker, in my opinion, right? Like, I, I mean, I guess like if you're like, hey, I did it, go me, and now I'm cool on all the, you know, dark web forums and stuff, like good for you. Um, but a zero day alone doesn't like actually really get you anywhere if you don't have a goal that follows that, right? Like if it'll get you in the network, but I think Nick, the point you were saying, like prepare, detect, mitigate other things and like watch your stuff, you know, people can drop zero days and then leave all they want. I don't really care. Um, I only care once they start actually doing something that furthers their objective or hurts me uh, on my network, I guess. So that's kind of the point, I guess maybe a good distinction between like zero days for zero days sake and zero days for like an actual goal. Nothing really changes because they still have to reach their goal. I'm not, I'd way uh, rather be crushed by a zero day than like some off the shelf, like <laughs> metasploit payload. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you're, you're not going to get hit with like a zero day unless you're like really targeted by whatever group designed the zero day. Right. Um, unless it's like, you know, some, some, person who's just going to spray it across the internet you're not going to be really targeted unless you're in an industry that's actively targeted by uh, that group or that, that threat actor who developed the zero day um so it's really just like what do you do when you're going to get breached no matter what i mean there's zero days out here and everybody panics oh patch 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 
But, you know, I mean, the, the exchange stuff, yeah, that kind of blew up recently, you know. Exchange was like, oh, yeah, let's just exploit everything when that happened, which now, you know, I, I'm calling that, you know, I, it's not a one day because there's no patch, but I'm like, hey, it's in the public. It's probably like a one day at this point. Uh, but, I mean, it's all about, you know, monitoring your network. I mean, I, I look at defensive security as I don't give a crap. I was going to say a bad word there, Jaeger, but I didn't. But I don't, get, I don't care about your patch management uh, from a defensive perspective. Uh, if you patch, that's awesome. That's great. You should be patching. But if you're breached, what do you do about it? Because there, there's configuration issues that aren't going to be picked up by your scanners. There's going to be things that you're going to get breached through, and you're never going to know you're breached. You're going to be the person who three months down the line, the FBI is going to say, hey, here's all the stuff we found on the internet that was dumped. I mean, let's go ahead and look at this recent news one, uh, T-Mobile, right? T-Mobile, supposedly they've been breached. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but... There's like 100 million customers plus or something like that from T-Mobile that T-Mobile was breached. And, you know, we're hearing about it not from T-Mobile. Maybe they knew about it. Maybe they don't, right? Uh, I saw a screenshot of the system that the hacker post supposedly that he got in from the internet. And it literally says, any malicious activity will go to, like, the T-Mobile cert incident response team. And I'm like, okay, well, do they even respond to this? Because he was able to exfiltrate so much data. And he said, he even said that he password sprayed across the environment. Now, if you can't detect that, I mean, that's a configuration issue. I'm, I'm sure T-Mobile's patching well. But that was a configuration issue. That's almost like a zero day, right? It's if you get breached, what do you do about it? Whether it's a zero day configuration issue or a, you know a one year old vulnerability, what do you do about that breach or that malicious activity on your environment? Can you see it even? Because in the case of T-Mobile, I don't know if they can see it or not. But if you're able to exfiltrate that much data and a password spread across the land to gain access, I mean, if you can't see that, then you've got massive issues in your 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 security posture from a perspective of you know detection and, and mitigation. And I think you shouldn't even focus on patching. You should fix up everything else in your environment. So, so would you put patching behind monitoring? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean. Well, you gotta have, you have to have the right people monitoring. They have as good of a reason as you do for for what your reasoning is. Like, I kind of agree with you after like you know hearing everything you said. I mean, like, if you look at if you look at patching, it's great and all. I mean, don't stop patching, right? Because there's going to be some exploits out there that are going to be meta exploit that you could throw at, at any organization. But if you if you're able to see what happens on your network, you can then respond faster. You can prevent maybe the the data breach or you know the exfiltration of data. Even it's all about that. I, I don't know. I hate using buzzwords, but cyber kill chain. Maybe like if you're developing detection mechanisms, you can prevent or kick people off your environment if you detect them. Versus, hey, I just patch everything. I'm great. I'm the number one security person in the world. You know, we've had, we have zero, we have zero findings in our scanner. Well, if I go and password spray against your, your non MFA portal and I gain access to your organization, what do you do about it? Do you even know I'm there? Well, and is a fish a zero day? Because those seem to work pretty consistently. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What about when you're talking about client side exploits? I hire zero users. So, you know, <laughs> they're, they're going to click on whatever. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the yeah. whole zero day thing for me, like, I think it's, it's great for your dark web clout, but I mean, if I can fish, You're like we, what I spend all that money on developing we, zero day, if I can just fish your users for you know whatever, it's gonna happen. Especially we patch all day, but yeah, and a company don't the check size of default passwords. A company the size of T-Mobile is gonna, I don't know, I don't even know Why? how many people click on that link at a company that big, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's not zero. It's it's not as you know, Are we, more than more people. We've all ran phishing campaigns. I mean, I've made, I made the most basic ones, some malware delivery. And, you know, I, I get click rates on every single one. I guarantee you, I mean, even the malware delivery, where I'm delivering malware to your mailbox that so you execute an HTA file on your system, like, there that I've got access. Like, every phishing campaign I've got, you know, that layer eight, I like to say the layer eight end user, right, of the OSI model, layer eight. It's the easiest one to get in on. Yeah, like I'm surprised if I ever see less than like a 20% click rate on a on a phishing campaign. And you know, if your company is 100 people, that's 20 people. So like, that's not much. And it seems like the smaller the company, the more of the click rate too, because everyone's doing everything. Everyone's busy. Everyone's in, like doing multiple jobs, so they're not thinking about what emails apply to them or you know that kind of thing anyway. So these companies are even worse off. And yeah, it's just nuts. So yeah, and people who are good fishers like. Bro, they're gonna get you one way or another. Like if they want to get you, they're gonna get you. I've been got. Like I'm not afraid to say. Like, like if you know your audience, man. Like <laughs> one of the fun things about working in yeah. cybersecurity companies is when you get phishing attacked, and then the cybersecurity professionals like have to do that walk of shame, like you know, through through the email and say like, "Yeah, it was me. I'm sorry, everybody." And like, well, I think like beyond that too is like 
you know, I, I come from, I didn't know anything about cybersecurity until I started like working with you guys and the amount of paranoia that has come within like being around you guys for five months is insane. That's awesome. Uh, I don't know how to use discord. So, you know, uh, I don't blame what's me. What's your fake name for everything? Jaeger? What you... Jaeger. Oh, I thought I had him there for a second. <laughs> no, I'm gonna say like, yeah. If you know how to fish, you're gonna get in. Like, so I mean, if you have an incentivization, like, so um, you know, if you have a health program and we we talk and you give like you know free money for people working out or whatever, which most organizations have these like wellness programs. I've done fishing campaigns where I'm like, hey, I'm gonna give you free points here, or I'm gonna give you something like that, but it's based on your organization. So if it's based on like you know if you get like a fifty dollar gift card for free, it was like, well, hold on, that's kind of sketchy, right? Which a lot of us probably get those emails. But it's like targeted at the organization where it's like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna target your wellness program, or I'm gonna target your rewards program for you know any rewards that you offer in your organization, and like craft an email that just says, hey, here's free this. I've had people from you know incident response, security teams, vault patch management, blue teams, everybody click on that, and that's where you deliver malware, and you know you put it in like a, an HCA file, you make them do something. To, to do this and there's there's many ways for us just get access with phishing and if you're good you get in i mean that's that's how it is one thing I, I think that kind of pertains to this topic before we started talking about phishing which i know is probably been beaten to death like crazy by every single person who's ever worked in security but um the other thing i think that we don't we didn't talk about last week and we haven't talked about yet is disaster recovery plans or like oh. uh, data recovery plans as well because i just mm -hmm. You don't hear about them very often, in my opinion, probably not enough backups, like good backup strategy and good um, recovery and well, especially recovery, because that's when you're losing money is when you're not recovered. Um, so, I, I mean, we could talk about that a little bit, too, especially like in response to these kinds of things, right? Like you get hit zero day fishing, whatever, I, you know, it makes me wonder what, what's T-Mobile doing from from like a recovery standpoint or anything, you know. Or maybe that's not a good example because it's more of a data. Person. I don't know, but it, but it costs a lot of money. Well, whatever yeah. they're doing is they're not, they're, they're, they're telling the news is not bad. I mean, look at Accenture. Accenture was just freaking ransomware as well. They're like, hey, trust us, it's not that bad. Like, okay, you just ransomware. It's not that bad. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, like, like, I guess. Yeah, man. I guess it's one of those things, though, like, you know, it doesn't make good news to hear about, like, what they're doing to fix it as opposed to, oh, my God, this big company just got, you know, ransom for this amount of money. Like, so, of course, you don't hear about it very, very much. So it's probably pretty cool to actually, like, kind of dive into that and kind of figure out what people do. If I were a company, I would base my PR campaign getting hit by an attacker around, like what I was going to release post compromise. Like I would want people to know, or I guess I would, I would base what I was going to do on the assumption that everybody would know what I was going to do post compromise. Because I think a lot of people are like, Oh, we got to keep this in the dark. We don't want anybody to know, you know, that we got attacked. No, dude, people get attacked. That's what happens. It's about how you recover from it. I think I think honesty and being open is is the way to go. Like I, I all these companies, are like hey, we're I mean we're we're looking to see what's been compromised or or things like that. But if you just sit there and be like, no, nah, deny, 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 or no, we're not going to pay the ransom. I think you should be upfront. I think if you're breached and if you're ransomware, uh, whether you're going to pay it or not pay it, I mean, I mean, be upfront. I mean, tell everybody how it's happening or what's happening from your incident perspective, right? Unless you're under like legal obligations, maybe you know you're a government contractor and you got like the FBI saying you can't say X, Y, and Z or you know whatever, right? But I think the more upfront you are, the better you're going to have that relationship with your customer still or your, your, your clientele, whatever it's going to be. You're going to retain that relationship. And it's, it's not, I mean, you might lose some, but it's, it's all about that reputational status there, in my opinion, is everybody's getting attacked. And if you're breached, you're going to hurt your reputation more than anything if you're just going to be lying about it or if you're not going to be upfront about, hey, this is what happened to our organization. This is how we're responding. And this is how we're doing going to do it better, right? I think always saying, hey, this is our next steps on how to do it better is important. While a lot of security people are like, hey, whatever, you should have been doing that in the first place. It's always good to hear, hey, we're going to actually start doing this now, right? This might be yeah, awesome, I think it's not necessarily in re response to a breach or anything, but do you guys remember, it might have been two and a half, and you might not remember it either, but do you remember two and a half, maybe years ago, it was one of the major CDNs, it was like Akamai or Fastly or something, they had a huge, they DDoS themselves because they pushed like an evil regex to their, to whatever was That's filtering, excellent. do you guys remember that at all? No, we also got most of their data centers. Okay, well anyway, 
the only reason I bring it up is they put out probably and, and they kind of attacked themselves because they pushed like a bad regex to whatever system it was that was filtering you know requests and and they published like a a sweet blog post that I learned more about regex uh, from their blog post about their incident response basically than I have about and I've already forgotten because it's regex and that's what you do but. Like they posted this super interesting article where they walked through their entire like deployment process for how it actually got pushed to production. They walked through the exact rule and exactly how it spiked their CPU usage to like 150% because it was like self-referencing or whatever and and doing an awful job of filtering. Anyway, I'll have to find the article and I don't know, Jaeger, if we have show notes in this thing or not. But if you I'll try I'll try to find it, post it. Um but yeah, it's a crazy story and it, it's like a perfect example of how they basically brought their senior engineer in and walked the public through how they hacked themselves in this case but i like a company that got hacked could do a very similar thing basically laying out you know we got fish we weren't following this patch we weren't following this best practice our passwords were eight characters long but now they're 16 or whatever it is but i mean i think that would help everybody else who hasn't been breached or could be breached right like i think uh so a lot of times when i talk to executives or CISOs, you know and organizations are like well this can't happen to us so this this isn't gonna happen to us but then if you know if there's more information about these other breaches out there that have already occurred you know maybe those CISOs would say okay look at our environment it matches this it matches exactly what happened with these five other breaches like we could be next right i think they're they're too confident that it's not going to be them they're not on the target list and the one thing I do recommend that if you are breached not to do is say it was the intern's fault. Because that happens all the time. It's the intern. It's like, no, it's not. There is a holistic issue that you interns, have. Man. 140 characters, Nick. It fits on a Twitter. You're like, we don't pay anything to those guys. Burn them. <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm just like, that's like, like, everybody blames the intern. I'm like, no, you have a holistic problem with security if you're blaming an intern anyways for your breach. Like, you right, have more issues than you could... Why does yeah. it have that much power? <laughs> like you have no issues. You, yeah, you suddenly have an internal systems processes problem, not a... Yeah, you've got bigger issues. You left him alone for one hour. <laughs> it's crazy, too, because like, um, I think a lot of it comes down to like the litigation and stuff that follows these now, too. Um, I think the pipeline that got hacked, they're getting sued. Like, So to admit fault is just like, is that... Yeah, that's fair. Additional millions. Well, that's yeah. that's because it's like it's like mental health, man. We criminalize it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like I'm not saying we, but uh, everybody shakes a finger at, at Pete. They're like, "Oh, got those guys." And I'm like, "Bro, that could be you tomorrow." <laughs> like, Probably you, you know, I'm yeah. right. I I don't know. I mean, I think there's certainly something to be said for some standard practices that like we keep going back to and talking about, you know, um, I, I feel like, I, I don't know. What do you guys think is, is, is a better, you know, how can we do better about getting companies across the board to internalize basic practices? I mean, sure. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's monitoring, it's knowing your network, but I, you know, it goes back to the same thing we were talking about before. Like if you don't have a network diagram, like, <laughs> We're kind of starting to grow one. So, you know, how do you get how do you get the masses um to do I think, you know obviously part of it starts with consultants and, and people doing things just like this, like podcasts and saying, Hey, um, you know, offering help. I mean, like the reality is help costs money. Um, but at the same time, you know, that's got to be something that your business plan uh, funnels into, because if you don't have that as part of your uh, your initial like business plan, then then eventually you're going to get hit and, you know, you're going to go down. I well, I mean, though, that was a question. It's kind of like what Ryan just said, though, if more companies were actually putting out what happened and walking through why it happened then you can learn from that and maybe it won't cost as much money because you learned a new problem that you had that you didn't know you had and you were able to fix it. So, you know, honesty probably helps a lot with other people too. No, I think that would help some, but let's be real. There's a lot of people who are still not going to listen to it. Right. I think the big thing that, that, I mean, and this is not something that we can do either as like individuals 
in our positions. I mean, we can consult and say these things, but I think the big thing that needs to happen is you need to have security top down, right? You need to have people that, or even just IT, like you need to have good security and IT hygiene from that C level or that board of directors. You, we need to start expanding our knowledge base into those higher levels of positions where they can say, hey, the company, like, they need to look at the company from a risk perspective of actually having that technical knowledge, right? A lot of the C-suites that we see nowadays have no technical knowledge or technical backgrounds or even the security. And I'm not saying that they have to be a C-suite or, you know, a, or a board of directors, but those people need to listen then to your, your directors of security or your CISOs, right? And if they're not listening or if they're just kind of saying, hey, we'd rather make profit here and we're going to accept this risk, well, then you're definitely going to accept that breach that occurs because I guarantee you it's going to occur if you're just going to accept the risk and not listen to the technical people that are, you know, giving these things like, hey, we need to go to the basics. Because if you don't have it from the top down, you always hear the engineers, oh, I got all these other priorities, right? You have to have the top down come and say, hey, here's the priorities that we need and actually assign that work versus, hey, we're going to give you a thousand more priorities versus those basics that we don't even do right in the first place. Yeah, the, the issue that, I mean, it's just not, cybersecurity is just not cost effective yet is really what it comes down to because the C-suite only talks in numbers, you know, from... And they have a, you know, whatever, a fiduciary duty to their shareholders or whatever to, and, you know, that's their job. They have to do it. It's literally, it's just not cost effective yet. You can teach everybody everything. You can give them every step by step in every, you know, on a blog post or whatever, a documentation. But if it costs them more money to put it in place than they think they're going to lose, they're not, it just cannot happen. Uh, it's just not going to happen and i don't know how to make cybersecurity more cost effective if that means uh going one direction and putting fines on all these companies that are getting breached so that you know hey you weren't compliant so you now we're going to make it unbelievably expensive for you which is the you know criminalized version of it and the other half would be to say like we'll help you we'll give grants like i don't i don't know like are we gonna use public money to I think to some extent you have to take responsibility, though, you know, at the same time. Well, personal and, responsibility isn't cost effective either, but I understand what you're saying. Right. But so that brings up another um, another thing that I was going to go into, which I think is also an issue. Um, I think that there's a lack of capability um, that people have. And when I say people, I mean, whoever makes up these or, you know, let's say that, that, that a company does put good money into cybersecurity and they hire technical recruiters and the technical recruiters hire people, but they hire people that can't actually do the job that they're getting hired for. And I think that's a huge part of the problem um, because I think people, all, at least in my experience, um, contractors particularly are making money all over the board and they're just sitting in there, man. So if that money was better managed which is a difficult <clears throat> a difficult thing to do but if that were to actually go to people who are more technically savvy then i think that it would go a lot farther and i think that's a a problem that a lot of people don't realize i'm not saying you guys don't realize it, but i i think that that's something that's kind of like under the covers um of a lot of a lot of these companies like like nate was saying about vendors they're throwing money at stuff it's just not <laughs> stuff I was about to say that. I think back to my vendor conversation of, hey, stop spending money on vendors. Spend it on your people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you got to gotta pay for good. Well, there's a skill set, but you got to pay you know, for good people and you can train them. I mean, you could, there's, there's opportunities out there to train, right? I mean, I'm not going to say, I mean, you should always have senior staff, right? You should always pay for good senior staff. And I know there's the skill gap out there. And we're talking about, you know, people coming in and we're looking for skilled talent to do this work because there's a lot of, unskilled professionals that I would say that are professionals in the industry, right? But if they're dedicated and your organization is willing to spend money on training them, I guarantee you you're going to one up your security than most other organizations that don't have training. I mean, if they have a CISSP, they're probably good, right? Oh, they God. can do anything. Yeah, don't get me started on the, uh, the, ma the, master the master's degree of security. No. <laughs> the reason that I brought that up is so I was... I, I won't mention the, the company, but I was on a hiring board and I, I was part of the process and we hired this dude and like he he talked the talk, you know, like we thought he was good. Um, but then we tried to get him to go to training and he like he just wouldn't do anything. And so then we finally got him in, like it was my team, you know, and I was in charge of this guy. And so we got him to um, to training to technical training and he like 
dude, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't load Metasploit, you know? I mean, he couldn't uh, write, you know, he couldn't get into the Python interpreter. And so I had to like totally rethink the process of hiring people because clearly I had failed. And, you know, obviously we got rid of him, you know, like, like yesterday's news, but, you know, but, but I had to like rethink the process for hiring. And I think that that's an, that's an issue, man, because people are like, yeah, oh, this, this guy's got a CISSP. He's got a SANS, like not talking on SANS, but, you know, he's got a certification that says that he's some kind of uh, cybersecurity professional. And, you know, you and I both know that that's not really very telling. I think, you know, experience talks uh, talks for itself in, in some regards, right, in interviews. I think experience will always talk for itself. You have five, six years of experience. You haven't, you know, been jumping 20 jobs at that time. You're probably pretty decent at what you do. But if you're hiring people that don't have that, I always think a practical assessment, whether it's, you know, detection, whether it's configuration, or, or you know, a red team or CTF type style, or like a, a hack the box or Volhub for like a, a pen tester position, right? I think all of those are crucial, especially for those more entry level positions to actually truly understand their technical capabilities. Uh, most of the individuals that I've hired, um, and actually two of them here, you know, work at, uh, at Open Security, Blake and Bryce as well. I've done uh, practical assessments when I hired them, right? I mean, I set up a four hour interview with them where I gave them a lab and said, hey, whether you can do anything or not, I just want to see your thought process and how you go against it. And I want you to not write a full report, obviously, in that time frame, but give me some of your findings when this is over, right? And from an offensive perspective, I mean, that gives me good talent. It gives you talent that I know can hit the ground running. Um, and, and maybe I'm looking for someone who can't, but most of the time I am from an offensive security perspective. I want someone to get the ground running, right? From a, a soccer security protection, I mean, there's labs out there. There's like a spoke attack range, right? You could go just set up a bunch of logs out there and be like, hey, come in and show me what you know about a, like detection. But there's no yeah, organization that do that. <clears throat> yeah, not everybody knows everything. Like everybody's going to clearly have their certain areas. But I think if you, so what I came to, the conclusion that I came to is, again, practical application, like you're talking about, um, you know, sit them down, have some focused questions about what you're intending for them to do, uh, and then answer it without a reference, you know, whether that's in practice and you have a lab set up or, or both and, and, and on paper, you know, like, all right, you know, you're going to create some shell code. How would you do it? You know, they don't have to do it perfectly. The the return doesn't have to be like, oh, I would write the C file and then I would strip out the opco. You know, I mean, they could just like give you what they got, but that's going to give you a lot better idea than asking random questions, which is how like 90% of the hiring boards I've been on. And that wasn't my choice. You know, that came from above me, which I think is is a lot of times the problem. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm, totally I'm, I'm off that. challenges, and there's no shortage of of things that you can use. You don't have to build your own practical challenges. Like I, I know Nick would because you know he's Nick, but you know, he's cool. You don't, yeah, because he's cool like that. But you know, you don't have to do that. There's so many things, and like, let's be honest, like pen tester labs or attack attackdefense.com or whatever. That's their like online thing. It costs like thirty bucks a month. Could a company who's about to hire a six figure employee? afford you know an account for 30 bucks a month to just throw a practical challenge or or five or six at them and and use it as the interview process absolutely um it it blows my mind that there aren't corporate accounts you know i've never heard of anybody doing that with like a corporate paid account just but they a lot of companies they'll build their own internal testing and, and whatever and it's like you spent a lot more money doing that than you could have using everything out there and it's probably really good it's probably exactly what you need but but the other thing, and I want to talk about this maybe a little bit later, is like what was true a month ago, you know, when your company built this thing, it's not going to be good. You're going to have to keep developing this stuff. You're going to have to keep up with it. But the community is putting it on themselves to do it for you. So leverage that, you know, especially if you're a small company, um, you don't need to. And you want technical challenges because you've been asking the, you know, the conceptual knowledge base questions and not having good luck with it, which I am not surprised at the outcome. Um, there are options out there. There's tons of good options out there. And uh, it, it it doesn't take a Microsoft sized company to build or to use a um a, a lab range for an interview. Uh, there's tons of good stuff out Sounds there. Sounds like we're back to Nick's talk on free tools. Don't put this guy live, but uh, Brian's gonna be pissed for talking about a product idea he has. He's gonna he's gonna build an entire interview process out of a, out of basically like all practical things for both offense and defense. <laughs> Free interview tools. That'll be my next. My next. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. 
I don't have to. Do I would that. really throw him for a loop. I'd be like, I want to see you horseshoe. They'd be like, what? Well, so I mean, I had a uh, actually interestingly enough, um, passion's a big thing on interviews, right? I, I think passion and what you do is going to be a big thing in throwing passion. In. So actually, when I interviewed for a job once, uh, the man, uh, one of the guys that was interviewing me at the time, I was a mechanic in my previous life, right? Um, and so, uh, nice. So, uh, so basically, um, I go to this interview, right? And uh, the guy, I'm just sitting there, I'm answering a whole bunch of questions, draw, you know, like a secure environment, which is a great question actually for almost anybody because if you can think about securing an environment, you can kind of think about security, whether it's you know physical security that you're drawing or anything else, right? But I'm answering all the security questions and you know technical questions and all that stuff, and then out of the blue. Hey, what's the difference between 5W30 and 5W20? And I'm like, what? You know, and so I, I find, yeah, the viscosity, you know, right? And I, and I come back to it, and I'm, I answer the question right, but I come back after I got the, I got that job, actually. Um, and so I, I asked the guy, I was like, hey, why'd you ask me this question? He's like, well, it shows that you pay attention to what you're doing, and you, you put your passion into it. Like, you, you, you put yourself into your job because you remember something from a previous job. I mean, that was probably, I was probably like, because uh, I was in uh, to a sock before the job I got there so it's probably like a two-year difference right and he was like it showed that you had passion or enough understanding of what you were doing and that you wanted to learn about it that you actually understood you know like he's like i had no idea what the difference was i had to google it before i interviewed you so i also did this to a guy that worked at a pool before i asked him you know what the the uh chlorine level or whatever it is supposed to be it, it, or the uh ph level of a pool is supposed to be he's like i googled that before because i don't know these answers but it shows me that you're willing to throw yourself into the job yeah, that foundational knowledge, like those building blocks that are just like the always true, like kind of stuff, like the difference between whatever the heck you were talking about and pH levels and pools and stuff like um, that. Yeah, the foundational stuff, I think, is a lot of things that people skip over. They want to go straight to Metasploit and like throw exploits, but they don't even understand what a port is versus like a service. Right. Like they think that because it's port 80, it's automatically, you know, web, which, you know. And basically, which it is, I mean, basically, but it doesn't have to be right. You know, you could (laughs) be a jerk, do something weird for some reason, but, you know, break up. Yeah, man, I used to uh, uh, like, good luck, you know, good luck, everybody. I don't know. You're describing um, the OSCP bros, is like I like to call them, the OSCP bros, who everybody in their right mind is taking the OSCP and they're like, I deserve a job as a senior pen tester right now. I'm like, dude, I don't even have my OSCP. I do this for a living. Like, no, you, there's a whole different ballgame than just doing the OSCP, man. <laughs> Along with passion goes, you know, like just being capable. You know, we live in a time period where, well, for one thing, security is something that changes every day. So if you knew something yesterday, like you were saying, you don't necessarily know it today, which means that you need to reference stuff and read things and look things up. Uh, So I'm much more concerned with somebody who's malleable than someone who knows all about, I don't know, SMB or something. (laughs) Couldn't think of anything good, but you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, that actually makes me think about like the years of experience requirements that you see on job postings a lot of the time too, is like, that's great. You so have 10 years of experience, but what did you learn about 10 years ago that, that, you know, is exactly the same today? A lot of things foundationally, like totally, I get you like, yeah, the basics are still there. Like a secure environment is still a secure environment, but, but to say, you know, you knew all this stuff 10 years ago, you moved to management and now you want to be a pen tester. I don't want that guy. I want the like, you know, the one year of experience who's just doing this because those skills they degrade and you have to go back and learn it all anyway, constantly. Like regex, like I said earlier. I don't know regex. I love love I regex. I, know. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> you know, but I know exactly. It's so funny. funny. No, it's so funny. Every time I teach, like when I always hear people they're like, oh, I hate regex. And I'm like, don't know the power of regex. I don't know. I love regex. It's so powerful, but I hate it because I've always got to do it. Right. I was going to reference it. I'm always doing like regex or regex 101. I'm like, all right, let me go figure out. I'll tell you what I hate <laughs> is PowerShell regex because it's straight garbage. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's just implemented it poorly. Uh, it's basically the same. It's just yeah. But my point is, um, you know, time time in the industry means nothing to me. Uh, if I'm interviewing somebody and it's funny when I see contracts and stuff that require like five years of experience pen testing or whatever, I'm like, I, it's not going to help you a whole lot. If the guys did it five years ago and he's been off for four years, like all that experience is stale. He's just doing the same wrong stuff for five years. So yeah, yeah like he's, he's sucked for five years, but I don't know, you know, like I'd rather have this guy who just, just learned something and maybe sucks at it the same way, but hasn't gotten it, you know, 
burned into his brain that that's the way you do it. You know, I, I actually see a lot of value in like the younger, like, you know, not experienced folk. That doesn't mean that they're unskilled. Um, there are unskilled people, but that doesn't, there, one does not necessarily uh, mean the other. I think, you know, you know, I guess a passion, like what else do you do other than just trying to do this as your day job, right? Or just trying to get a certificate. So I, you know, I made a joke, OSC people are us, but like, if you always use the RCP, like, I mean, yeah, you're learning and all that, but there's, there's more to it. Do you have a lab? Do you understand defensive stuff? Um, or even like interested in security as a whole, or are you just in this for the money? Because I, I see a lot of people that are like, oh, offensive security is sexy. Pen testing is sexy. I want to be a hacker. And I'm like, okay, well, there's a lot to it that isn't really, quote unquote, the sexy term that you're, you're thinking here, right? And the job is way different than what you expect. But I like to see, you know, like people like on the resume say, oh, you know, I do a home lab or I have a home lab and I, I'm interested in technology as a whole. I'm interested in offensive security so much that I'm doing it myself. Or on the resume, I've seen this a couple of times. And I'm like, yes, hire this guy. I'm a professional Googler. Oh, really? Hell yeah, I am too, man. I love that about you. Let's hire you. Like, that's what I feel when you, you know, like, that is awesome. If you know how to search and find the answers and then, like, take that application and use it in an engagement of, of what you just learned, perfect. I love it. I'll hire you. I might add that to my interview question list. Like, what's your favorite Google, like, dorking, like, <laughs> shortcut or, you know, whatever command, Google search yeah. command? Yeah, I don't even know what they're called. I guess I call them dorks, but yeah. Um, like, people who know, like, the site, colon you know like yeah i way used to spend of, hours you know, just finding dumb even, stuff with google yeah like you know site site colon and then file type colon like that'll yeah. in url <laughs> be like oh my god yeah we need to hire this index guy. of i mean even you're searching for like exploits right like i've been in engagements where you know there's you always see this technology just like four years out of date right and everybody Googles the technology. They're like, oh, I can't find anything off the first Google. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't mean there's nothing there. I've been on engagements where everybody's like, oh, that's a dry hole, that's a dry hole, dry hole, dry hole. And I was working with like six other testers on this engagement. And I'm like, all right, well, let me just keep digging. And actually it was called the Business Intelligence Reporting Tool. It's like a, an Eclipse something application, real old, like a crappy application. But, you know, it took me long enough. I found their blog post. I started digging through their blogs and all that stuff. And then I go back and I find this one guy who's got a POC exploit that he posted to their blog of, uh, and you know, there was, there was no post anywhere else anywhere. And I'm like, boom, done. And it was remote code execution. I'm in. But I, that just took Google. That took persistence and understanding how to search for things versus like, Hey, I did a search and there's nothing there. It's like, are you persistent? Are you persistent yeah, enough exactly. to like actually do good searching? I searched the Metasploit database and nothing came up. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it, the it, first place I like. It, I don't I, even look on XDB because there's like never anything there, there that I need. <laughs> it's just, I mean, never, I mean, most engagements i go into it's always like that's why i hate going i mean i go after configuration issues more than vulnerabilities because it's always like if you have patch management down like a lot of organizations don't but if you do then i'm not going to get into an exploit over like one of your little patch one of these vulnerabilities and that's why i keep going back to you know detect and monitor and all that stuff is i'm going to go after that configuration i'm going to go after your users i'm going to go after your passwords if it's an engagement and i've got you know i've got an open scope to just gain access i'm going to get in we should get sponsored what? Oh, wait. I was going to say, we should get sponsored to do like a, I don't know, like a, a pwn attack road tour. And we should just, we should just like offer free services. Like we should get investors and just offer like free services for like, for companies. Like, hey, we'll just come in and check your stuff out and just see like how busted stuff is. Like, and just help people out ultimately. And the only reason I say get investors is because time is, you know, everybody's time is worth something. So sadly, investors won't like when you say free service but no i mean in a perfect world i'm totally on board with i mean you. It's, it's a market it's a marketing it's a marketing ploy right we do you know a few months of right. free service and then hey you're gonna hire us to come back in i mean i look at it as you know there, there's a conflict of interest maybe but hey we go do the red team thing and then we, we we have the guys that come and say hey we're gonna come fix this for you too so then you know you go and you fix it right I mean, hey. yeah it's like pirates i always wanted to be a pirate but i just figured that i would be both a pirate and one who saves people from pirates yeah I mean, that's the best of both worlds. Bad and good at the same time. Um, it's funny, though, that you bring up a like, You said, like, everyone thinks pen testing is sexy. It's it's crazy, because what is it? Like, probably 45% reading, 45% thinking, and 10% maybe actually on a keyboard. There's, like, a cartoon I saw a couple weeks ago that was, like, a, it was a programming cartoon, but it was kind of the same thing. Like, a guy walks up behind his friend sitting at a computer. He's like, what are you doing? And the guy's just staring at his computer. He's like, I'm thinking. And the other guy says, like, oh, I thought you were working. And the guy, like, turns around. He's like, that's what I just said I was doing. Like, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, that's all we do is we just read and think. Like, that's, report writing. 
Well, and okay. report writing. Oh my God, report writing. That is the most downside that people don't understand about. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a OSCP or like a hack the box of hey, I get access, I'm done. No, no, it's a hey, tell me what you did, where, why, and how, and everything else that we want to know, and then tell us why we should even fix this and how. I mean, you've got to really understand the whole thing. You're right. It's 45% reading, 45% thinking, 9% report writing, and 1% actually like do, doing the hacking. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's, I, yeah, I'm going to add that Google dorking thing to my interview question. That's all I've gotten out of this hour, I think, at this point, you know, but, uh, but I think that's like a great. That's probably all that we've really talked about. It's worth it. So be a professional Googler. If you put that on your resume, you're going to get a job. Um, well, do you guys want one last quick question or no? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, there's another thing that kind of came up uh, the last time we did this, and it kind of stuck out to me, which was, why would me, as a company, want you guys to come in if I already have an in-house security team? Uh, I think it's a different perspective, right? So um, your in-house security teams are going to get complacent. I mean, no matter where you're at, you're, you're going to get complacent. Now, I don't know if you have a red team or if you have a defensive team, right? We're an offensive team. If there's an offensive team... Um, Maybe you know they're 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 pretty solid at what they do, and and maybe you want a different eyes on it. But if you only have a defensive posture, right? If you only have a lot of companies don't have their own pen testers, their own red team, right? A lot of companies have that defensive maybe portion of it. Um, the larger companies definitely have red teams, but the, the smaller ones don't. They have maybe a few soft guys, and that's it. You bring us in to show you where your your true risk is associated, right? It's it's not going to be what your vulnerability scan is going to show you. Yeah, well, we might run that for you for doing a vulnerability assessment. But we're going to actually show you where you have other critical vulnerabilities. Maybe they're in configurations. Maybe they're in uh, monitoring detection areas, right? It depends on the engagement you'd hire us for, but you bring us in to show you where that true risk association is in your organization with different findings that aren't going to be based on a vulnerability scanner that you're just running every once, every once a week, once a month, whatever you're doing. We're going, to, we're going to provide the value of where you're probably going to actually get breached from. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, another, another point is... Um... Your internal teams, you know, they're in their their frame of mind. They're in their you know their lane, and they get in those ruts, and they stay there, and they know exactly what they're looking for. And actually, even if you are hiring out, uh, we were actually I was on a client call a week ago, and they're you know trying to make a sale basically, and they said, hey, you know, even if we don't pick you for this sale, um, we'll probably come around in a year or two and and maybe ask you guys to come in then because we rotate our security contractors too. Um, and it's like, yeah you should because you want as many people's eyes on this whole situation you got going on as possible. And like, I'd like to make the sale and, you know, take your money every year and do the test for you every year and, you know, have that work and, and all that. But no, you're totally right. Um, if you have five guys who are just looking at your same, your, you know, the same ones looking at the network over and over and over again, they're going to miss something because they know what they know. Michael, you talked about it earlier, how people have gaps, you know, and not everybody knows everything. But together, hopefully, we know enough to to you know hit ninety nine percent of everything. Um, and so, yeah, even if you you hire us once and then you don't ever hire us again, but maybe not for like four years because you're rotating. Like, good for you. You're doing the right thing too. Um, even if you have your own internal team, you need third party. You need more eyes, as many eyes as you can possibly get. Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> you know there's, there's a couple reasons, and and you know just to reiterate. I think one of those is, you know, networks and, and software and all this stuff, like it's really complex and it's kind of a surprise to me that it works at all. Um, and so as that complexity increases, having a small group of people trying to have all eyes on all of that complexity is, is it's kind of asinine, really. I mean, you know, and there's no way that you can employ enough people to have a hand across all of that or every different perspective regardless of how many people you have on your team. So the way to fix that is to get alternative perspectives. You know, it's, it's, it's a Rorschach test. You know, you're having, well, what does this guy see? Well, what does this guy see? Um, and then, you know, what they see is going to be based on background and technical experience, right? So Nick's going to see different stuff than, than I'm going to see. Ryan's going to see different stuff than, uh, than Nick's going to see, you know? And <clears throat> how you pick what team you come in and test should be based on you know their background experience and how that relates to your scope um so you know i think that both of those things ultimately it's just a second pair of eyes or a third fourth fifth pair of eyes because no um you know i think that anybody in business figured out a long time ago that not one person can do it all 
or not do it all best, <laughs> you know? So you're just leaning on other people's capabilities to come in and try to, um, to help essentially. For sure. yeah, I, really, I really like how you basically say like, yeah, I mean, we'll all find different things from a perspective, just the three of us. Right. I mean, we all, we all work for open security, right. And we're all going to find something different or a different way. And that's because we have different backgrounds. We have different views. It's, we're not, we're, we're coming in with fresh eyes and each of our eyes are going to be different than, and each year if you have a different contractor, it's going to be different than the guys that sit there and watch it or the guys and gals that sit there and watch it 24 seven, right? You're always going to have a different perspective and everybody here knows how to do something different than the other person. And that's going to return different results every time. How many times would you say you guys have been on a, like an internal, maybe network test or something and, and you put something in the report and then the client comes back and says like, no one's even looked for that before. Like. I, I do it with like the nmap scripting engine. I don't think many people run many of the scripts in the nmap scripting engine, but I run like as many of them as I possibly can. And I find random stuff on there all the time that people are like, why would you even have been looking for that? I was like, I oh, don't know. There was a script there. I just ran it because like I saw that every, you know, the service was there. I figured let nmap do the work while I work on something else. And because, you know, someone else did that work to automate it for me, I was totally going to use it. Um, and, and they come back and like, no one's looked for, uh, open relays inside of our network before. No one's ever looked for, you know, default my SQL passwords on my network before, but there's an Nmap script that'll do it for you. Um, so I was just curious if you guys have ever, like, if you guys have like one of those like tried and true things that, you know, no one's ever looked at before. Um, and you kind of pull it out and you know, it, it almost always shows up or something like that. I mean, for, for and take me till next time. <laughs> From my perspective, the one thing that I always find is, you know, outdated uh, appliances or web applications. So, I mean, I pretty much, I mean, I found, I found Apache struts in a semantic VIP gateway once. And that's like, that's, that's your multi-factor authentication server right there. Cause it was outdated, but it's an internal and they're like, Hey, I mean, I just find outdated software. I mean, I, I, web applications is my tried and true on an internal assessment. If, I, if there's a web application, I'm probably going to get in somewhere. And, and I'm not a web application guy. I mean, I can do web application pen testing. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I like doing that, but I'm a network guy. Like I am great at network pen testing, red teaming, pivoting. But I will go after web apps because I know they're not gonna. You're not gonna be patching your software, your vendor software, that often because it just gets left behind. I mean, it works. Why, why? There's no. There's no big security issue. My vulnerability scanners don't find it. So I'll just go look for you know outdated web applications every time. If I can find something that has four years out of date, like it's four years was like the, the copyright date on the website, I'm golden. I'll know I'll find a way in. I feel like I can always find something with with network traffic. Like I always put a sniffer online and let it like do the work for me. And there's always like some website that'll be like, oh, we didn't even know we had that server. You know, <laughs> it's like, I feel like that's really common. But same with like web app stuff, you know, they're like, oh, never knew this was exposed. <laughs> and it's always unencrypted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm doing some network. They're like, hey, it's all a big deal. And I'm like, oh, man. If only you knew. Just encrypt everything. Just. Computers are all fast. The things. Yeah, just do it. Well, I think that's uh, about our hour, guys. Cool. Sweet.